This is a tutorial to develop a Monte Carlo simulation for Comte Buffon's needle experiment, as we discussed in class. This tutorial is going to be using three packages. I'm going to import the matplotlib.pyplot, refer to it as plt for plotting, import scipystats, and refer to it as stats for running statistical tests, and import numpy and refer to it as MP for managing numerical data. So in Buffon's needle experiment, there are two key parameters of interest. One is the line width. This is the distance of the, of the lines, the distance that lines are separated. In class, uh, our lines were three inches apart. The other key parameter is the needle width, or the needle length. Uh, the toothpicks that we used in class were 2.5 inches long. Now the first key step of developing a Monte Carlo simulation is to describe the key random variables um, that are relevant to this problem. And in this case, in class, we had identified that one of these key variables is D, which is the distance from the center of the needle to the nearest line. And we've identified that D is drawn from a uniform distribution between 0 and the line width divided by 2. So rather than developing a continuous process generator for this random variable, I'm simply sampling from the uniform distribution generator that's built into the NumPy package. The other key random variable of interest is the angle of the needle with respect to the lines, the acute angle. And we had called this the variable theta. And this is also drawn from a uniform distribution between 0 and pi over 2. So these are the two primary random variables in this experiment. Um, however, what we're ultimately interested in is the observation of whether a needle crosses a line or not. So this derived random variable, I'm going to package into a function called generate needle drop. This function will compute these two primary random variables and then perform the check if d is less than the needle length divided by 2 times the sine of theta. So if d is indeed less than this parameter, or than this equation that we, uh, that we developed in class, then we know the, the needle did indeed cross one of the lines and will return true. Otherwise, we'll return false. So let's run a quick check of our script so far. Um, we can generate a needle drop. That time it appeared to be true, true, false, and True, false, true. So it appears to be generating random needle drops. And uh, what we want to do now is perform a Monte Carlo simulation with this process generator to estimate the probability that the needle drop that the needle does indeed cross a line. So it's the probability that this generate needle drop function returns true. Now for our Monte Carlo simulation, the first thing I want to do is to set the random number seed to a fixed value so that we can have consistent results. Um, I want to specify at least an initial guess at the number of samples. So let's say let's start with a thousand samples. And the observations of these thousand samples I want to store in a new variable called observations. And I'll initialize it to a, an array filled with zeros of length num samples. So let's see if this is working. In our console, we can look at observations. It indeed is an array filled with zeros, and it appears to be about 1,000 a a thousand entries long. So then the core of the Monte Carlo simulation is to loop over all of our samples. So for a temporary variable i in the range of the number of samples, so this will take on values 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way up to 999. We want to store in our ith entry of our observations array the result 
of a generated needle drop. So this is storing uh, either true or false, which are represented in numeric numerical terms as one or zero in our observations array. And if we take a look at this observations array after running the script, it is indeed filled with a lot of zeros and ones. So the core result of the Monte Carlo simulation is to estimate the um, estimate the the expected result from this needle drop function. And uh, to do that, we can use a, the built-in uh, function uh, numpy.average of the observations. And if we run this in the console, for example, you can see that the average result of an observation is 0.53. It means that 53% of the time we um, had a success or that a needle did indeed cross one of the lines. Um, one of the, this is just the result of um, after a thousand samples. So if we did want to compute this observation um, throughout this Monte Carlo experiment, we can com keep computing this estimate for each of the thousand samples. Um, easy way to write that in script is to store this as a variable. The average of the observations, we're storing it as a mean estimate. But we want to repeat this observation for a number of different okay, number of different situations. We're going to use a generator in Python. So we want to compute the average of the observations from, let's say, observation in index 0 to observations in some temporary index i. And we want to reperform this for each of the values i uh, in the range of the number of samples. All right, and I have an invalid syntax. It appears that I'm missing, let's see what we get from our result. Invalid syntax, it looks like it, ah, I missed the word in, okay. So let's just recap this, um, this script. It's taking the average of the observations between number zero and i, for each of the values i in a range of between 0 and 1,000 number of samples. All right, so if I now look at this mean estimate, mean estimate, it's uh, built up of our like, current estimate at each point between 0 and um, 1,000. So one thing that may also be useful is to plot this data. So let's say, for example, we're going to have a create a new figure, plot.figure, and then plot in this figure um, the sample number, so range num samples. And technically, I guess that you have to add one to that. Um, and the mean estimate that we've calculated at each of these points in times. Now, in this case, it's arguing that we can't add one to these results because it's not actually a numpy array. So rather than using range, I'll use numpy.a range. So now we can see at each point, um, 0 to 1,000 samples, what was our current estimate of the probability of a needle crossing the line. We can see that there's a lot of jumping around in the early phases. This is because we have a relatively small number of samples that we're using to make this estimate. But over time, it's, it's appearing to start stabilizing to some steady state value, which and then we had seen that the last value here was about 0.53. So one of the things that we may be interested in doing is also visualizing the 95% confidence interval on this value. Um, let's just clean this up a little bit to add in an X label, which is the uh, sample number, and then the Y label is the estimate, is the uh, expected value of X, which is the probability of needle crossing line. 
So the 95% confidence intervals we can compute using a couple of other statistical measures. So we can first identify our significance level, which is typically described as the alpha variable. In this case, we could say we want to target a significance level of 0.05. Then our Z critical score is calculated using the stats dot norm or normal distribution dot PPF, which is a sort of inverse cumulative distribution function for one minus the significance level divided by two. So this in particular, I'll run the script again. The Z critical score is 1.96 for a significance level of 0.05 or 95% confidence interval. Um, we can use this to calculate our confidence interval, which is our Z critical score times the standard error of mean, which there's a nice function in the stats package, SEM. SEM computes the standard error of mean for our observations. So in this case, for our at our last sample point for a thousand samples, our confidence interval of the mean is about, our 95% confidence interval is about 0.03. Um, however, again, we may want to visualize this, how this confidence interval changes over the course of these thousand samples. So similar to how we recomputed this mean estimate for each sample i, we can wrap this confidence interval equation in an array and tell it to compute the standard error of mean for observations between 0 and some variable i and reperform that calculation for each variable i in the range of the number of samples. So now if we look at our confidence interval, it's an array of a thousand different values as the confidence interval computed at each period of time. And we can overlay these new results on top of our old plot by adding our confidence interval to create an upper bound or subtracting the confidence interval to create a lower bound. Let's take a look at our plot here. So it has a, now it's causing a, it's generating an error that it's not allowing us to add these two together. And that's partially due to we, us using normal Python lists rather than numpy lists. So an easy way around this problem is to simply use the numpy.add function to explicitly add these two variables together. And similarly here, we can use the numpy.subtract to subtract these two variables from one another. OK. We run the script, and now we can see our confidence interval, or 95% confidence interval, which is very large from the onset, then starts to stabilize and, normal, and uh, to, to smaller and smaller levels as we gain additional samples. Let's just clean this up a little bit more. Uh, I'm going to add in some labels. This is our mean estimate. Um, this is our 95% confidence interval uh, upper bound. Uh, this is our, oops, I want to assign this to a label. This is our 95% confidence interval lower bound. And maybe just to make these a little bit more consistent in color, I'll create both, make both of them a red line. All right, and then just clean this up a little bit more, put these on new lines so we can read them on my narrow screen and add in a legend in the best location. All right, so now we can see how our um, mean estimate and our 95% upper and lower bounds um, progress over the course of this Monte Carlo simulation. We can also see what happens, for example, if we change to 99% uh, 90, confidence interval. So I'll just update these labels here for a significance level of 0.01. Our 99% confidence interval actually looks pretty similar in terms of the displays. However, the Z critical score that we're computing against 
is now 2.57 instead of 1.96. So it is a bit of a larger boundary between these two values. Um, the other thing we can do is to see how this changes if we change the number of samples. So for example, if we compute 1,000 samples, it takes a little bit longer to run. Um, but we can see that over a much longer time, we get a narrower um, bounds on our confidence interval.